The Milken Institute is known for its convening power and its outstanding economic research. But what many of you don't know uh, is that we're divided into eight centers. Uh, these centers of knowledge are based in Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and Singapore. Uh, this year's, at, at this year's Asia Summit, we aim to bring these centers and their expertise to you. To give you a few examples, yesterday we, uh, yesterday's program featured a session on hyperaging that was moderated by Paul Irvin, who's the chairman of our Center for the Future of Aging. And this center promotes healthy and productive and per per purposeful aging. We had also two private sessions yesterday on macroprudential regulations and FinTech. These are two of many issues addressed by our Center for the Financial Markets based in Washington, DC. This center identifies ways to broaden access to capital and strengthen financial markets globally. Today's lunch, it was a joint effort between our Asia Center and our California Center. Uh, the moderator is Kevin Cloudon, the managing director of the California Center. Uh, people have asked me, well, what does the Milken Institute know about Hollywood? <laughs> because many here in Asia, uh, they see us more as a financial services um, focused. But actually, uh, we know a lot about Hollywood. Um, in the U.S., where our global headquarters are actually in Los Angeles, our California Center focuses on, uh, um, on ways to keep California's economy vibrant and growing. Um, so now I would like to welcome the panel the, who's going to talk about China's uh, growing movie industry. They promised me this is going to be the most entertaining panel of the whole summit. Not to set expectations high, but uh, we're looking forward to it. So please, uh, panelists and Kevin, come to the stage. Thank you. There was a time when Hollywood looked at China as little more than an exercise in the exotic. And China looked at America's cultural exports with suspicion. Why are you here? I'm here to fight for truth and justice in the American way. Thirty years after Superman became the first foreign movie distributed in China, the relationship between the two countries has transformed into a vibrant and vital symbiosis. I love one-fifth of the world population were the fastest growing economy, so when there's money, there's Hollywood. Experts say China, the world's fastest growing film market, will soon be the world's largest movie market. Depending on how you project the growth rate, 25% a year, 35% a year, then there's no question that in terms of box office revenue, that China will surpass North America. Hollywood needs China as the North American market has been flat. But China needs Hollywood as well, as you see with DreamWorks going in. DreamWorks Animation is collaborating with Chinese investors on a two and a half billion dollar Dream Center, a complete entertainment district that will also house production facilities. In another major move, Dolly and Wanda Group and its president Wang Jianlin, one of China's richest men, purchased AMC theaters in 2012. They are now building the largest movie studio in China, the $8 billion Qindao Oriental Movie Metropolis, which will feature 20 sound stages and be capable of producing more than 130 movies a year. In addition to quantity, Chinese filmmakers are expanding their artistic horizons with stories that reflect their own culture such as the highly anticipated Mountain Cry. Chinese movies have already proved they can earn as much as foreign imports, which are limited to only 34 movies per year. For a Shara movie to get the go-ahead, the script, including Chinese subtitles, must be approved by the country's top regulator. To get around these hurdles, Hollywood has been entering into partnerships with Chinese production companies. And in the case of Iron Man 3, sometimes filming content exclusively for Chinese audiences. Collaborations continue in a myriad of ways, from special effects made in China for American blockbusters, to American actors co-starring with Jackie Chan in one of China's recent mega-hits, and the investments and partnerships show no sign of slowing down.
it, it is absolutely the metaphor of the surrounded fortress. Yeah. <laughs> People on the inside, namely China, are trying to get out, and those on the outside trying to get in. Like two characters in a movie whose fates are increasingly intertwined, Hollywood and China continue their journey as the stakes continue to rise. Nice. Well done. <clears throat> well, thank you everyone for being here for lunch, and we hope that we'll be at least as entertaining as that clip. As Laura mentioned, I'm Kevin Cloud, and I'm Managing Director of the California Center at the Milken Institute, and I would like to take one moment to thank Laura and the staff of the Asia Center and our event staff for putting together this absolutely wonderful summit. And I would like to take a moment also to thank our uh, illustrious group of panelists who are here to inform and entertain you. Even though the subject is slightly lighter, we guarantee that this panel will have substance, it will have some drama, it will have a certain amount of entertainment, and I will also note that it's not terribly scripted, so don't mind us if we wander off a little bit. With me today on, uh, this, uh, on this panel is Starting over on my far right, your left, is James Fong. James is the CEO of Oriental DreamWorks, a model of Hollywood-China collaboration, which is backed by China Media Capital, Shanghai Media, Shanghai Alliance, and of course, DreamWorks SKG. He's got a great deal of experience in a number of different ways in Chinese investments, having previously worked for Amazon and the tech and media practice at China Tongying Merchant Bank and even Microsoft's investment in China. Immediately to my right is our resident sage. When I say this because of the fact, when she may dispute this, but Ellen Eliasoff is the president CS, the CEO of Village Roadshow Entertainment Group Asia. She was a pioneer in going to China early, back in 1979 as a student. She's also, in addition to the efforts that she's led in Village Roadshow, she is also in building up its presence there. She also was the pioneer for Warner Brothers back in 1993. She has not only distributed Hollywood productions in China, but has actually moved to uh, create, as you saw with the preview, with Mountain Cry and Journey to the West, high quality productions in China. So she can give us a number of different perspectives. On my left is Rose Kuo, who is uh, currently is here as the CEO and Artistic Director of the Qingdao International Film Festival Planning Team uh, in, in the Wanda Cultural Industry Group. And she is a key person in that development that you saw that clip of, the $8 billion studio that is going to be uh, built in Qingdao in China. But Rose knows movies, and she knows movies from a number of different perspectives. She previously ran the New York Film Festival, where she was uh, there at the film, running the Film Society of Lincoln Center, and she, before that, ran the AFI Fest in Los Angeles. So she has numerous different insights that she can offer to us. To her left and your right is Chris Bremble. Chris is the uh, CEO of BaseFX, which is the, and where he's the founder and CEO of the largest visual effects and post house in China, with. 450 employees there and having worked in over 130 productions, including the new box office champion Monster Hunt, which took over the crown of the most successful film with a Chinese release this year from Fast and Furious 7, so don't feel too bad about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and last, but certainly not least, since he is a man who has been a, a first in in many different ways, is Peter Shao, who is the founder and CEO of Orb Media. Peter, is uh, noted, was actually, uh, in addition to uh, uh, being a founder of Iron Pond, which made the first private equity style uh, film fund in China, was also the uh, man who worked on the first US-Chinese co-production and has been a key figure and advisor in numerous different uh, deals and investments and co-productions since then. Now, the question, that we are going to ask that's inherent in the panel title is with China's growing industry, does it still need Hollywood? And the fact is that if we want to go ahead and let's bring up slide one, as you can see here, China is growing dramatically. It's uh, 
for the most of the 20th century, the U.S. tended to be focused only on itself. The international market was secondary. That has changed, but not only has it changed, but in particular, China is changing things even more. And you can see the growth rate in screens just simply from 2011 to 2014. China will surpass the United States within the next decade as the largest overall film market. You go to the second slide. You can see here comparative grosses back uh, in 2014 between the top grossing films in the US and the top grossing films in China. Transformers Age of Extinction on its own almost matched the top grossing films in the US. That's a trend that one expects to continue. And third slide. And the other thing that you can see overall is the total box office. Yes, right now, the, the US is at, um, last year was at $10.4 billion to China's 4.63, but don't let that fool you. The Chinese box office in three years more than doubled. This is a trend that is tied not only to the emerging Chinese middle class, but as you saw, the tremendous infrastructure, not only of distribution, but of movie creation and entertainment that is going on in China right now. So given all that, the big question that you really have to ask is, does China really need Hollywood? I would argue, and the panelists can certainly agree and disagree with this, that if China doesn't care about the rest of the world, the answer is no. India certainly didn't need Hollywood. India has managed to develop Bollywood and its, and its prolific industry without the need for Hollywood. But if China cares about the rest of the world, then certainly right now the answer is yes. And we will discuss those particulars. And the first person I'm actually going to turn to for that is Chris Bremble. And I'm going to ask Chris, all right, what does Hollywood still have to offer that China needs? Um, I would say the most, the most important thing that, that we look for and we struggle with is process, right? So um, when we do, uh, we have a, an alliance with ILM um, and Lucasfilm in San Francisco. And in many ways for the last few years, you know, we would be the hands and they were the head. And so we, we really relied on that, that experience. Um, the average age at, at ILM as a facility is around late 30s, the average age at base of our staff is about 25. And so we're a young company, so a lot of it is process. And we see that going all the way through to um, uh, production uh, preparation techniques, previs, post-production. Um, China's still learning how to make the kinds of films that their audience wants. Um, you know, what we also see, one of the, one of the interesting things about base is that our staff are actually sort of our perfect focus group. They go out, they see every movie that opens, they see it Friday night, they are the vanguard audience. And so we, we talk to them a lot about what they want to see, and it's very interesting because they, you know, they never miss the big studio uh, tent poles out of the US. And then they're choosy about the, the local films. And so producers are now beginning to make this shift into how can we produce um, Hollywood quality pictures, and that really, that process, that knowledge is still not there. Um, what I often talk about is in the manufacturing business, you know, if you, in 1996 or so, manufacturing in China began taking off. By 2002, it was relatively mature. By 2006, it had somewhat peaked. Uh, for what we do in the film business, this is sort of around 1996, where you're beginning to see local producers begin to talk about craft, process, and um, how to build things and how to build movies. And so there's been more talk about development in the last 18 months than in, than in the five years previous in terms of how you create movies and stories. Great. Now, Peter, I saw you nodding. And you were, you were early in. So what drew you into the Chinese film industry in the first place? You certainly shifted fields a bit to go there. Well, I think for, um, you know, f for starters, this is an incredibly difficult business. And we're <laughs> starting to see the fruits of it now. But for me, and I think for a lot of other filmmakers, it starts from a very personal place. I love movies. I love stories. Uh, as a, as a uh, Chinese-American growing up in the States, the only images that I saw that were, pot, that were that with people who looked like me were cooks. And, and so for those of you who watched Big Valley, there's Hop Singh. So there weren't a lot of positive images. And I was really committed to doing that. I, and I saw intrinsically as a as the Asian American population in North America is 
approximately, you know, depending on if you include the Pacific Islanders, a very small percentage. If I wanted to revolutionize global cinema, you had to kind of drill down in China. So with that perspective in mind, I planted myself in China and uh, began to get into this business. So it was a personal place. But back then, it was esoteric. And I think Ellen would know this. Back when, <laughs> back when San Nituan was just a, a, a muddy road, <laughs> there was three bars. And filmmakers were artists, not conglomerates, not entrepreneurs. So, um, but I knew this day would come, and luckily I started when I was five, so we could still, <laughs> there's still an opportunity to really leverage the growth today. Well, we appreciate your child prodiginess. <laughs> okay, now Ellen, since that leads, leads into you, is that back when you were first uh, setting up Warner Brothers Beijing office, what was it like and what's fundamentally changed in building, this, uh, building a presence for Hollywood then and what's there now? Uh, I think. I think one of the points that Chris made was actually really important because the overall question of does China need Hollywood? Um, at that time, China really needed Hollywood. The industry in China needed Hollywood to reignite interest in actually going to the cinema. And it was full-fledged, not just the movies, but the cinemas, the projection facilities, um, the whole movie-going experience, distribution, marketing. Now, does China still need Hollywood for that? Definitely for the product, because since the beginning of the revenue-sharing importation of Hollywood movies, there has been a sense on the part of the Chinese audience that finally they are participating in the global film industry. They're online all the time. They know what movies are coming up. They know what franchises are in the mix in the rest of the world. And if those movies somehow were not coming in, there would be, well, there would be an audience outcry. And at the same time, the filmmakers need Hollywood because what's happened, and yes, it's true, Peter, was, they were auteurs, yeah. right? <laughs> in those days, because the only thing that Chinese filmmakers could really do. This is the fifth generation of filmmakers. Who exactly. Introduced they could, Chinese they films. They could make the art films, but that's what they could do, and they weren't really earning, they couldn't really make a career out of it for the most part. I mean, even Zhang Yimou was doing television advertisement work because he didn't have enough movie projects to work on. Now it's gone to the point where the directors, some of the older directors, most of the younger directors, want to make commercial movies for the audience. And the rules of how you make commercial movies for the audience are global filmmaking rules. And so we're having a very good experience working with this creative talent to help them make their movies better in every way. Not that we're telling them what to make or you know how they uh, should film it, but we're bringing the technical capabilities. We're doing the same that BASE is doing, actually, in development, production management, financing, distribution, and marketing that help them bridge that gap between what was the local industry doing even maybe five years ago and what it is capable of doing now and in the future. Now, James, you clearly represent uh, somebody and DreamWorks where you were actively recruited in some ways to say that you have a product, that DreamWorks had a product in the first two Kung Fu Panda movies, which were in very popular and highly desired. And you not only have a pro an immediate product, but you now have a whole studio that's coming out of that right. desire. What makes it, what made uh, that particular franchise so appealing? What makes what DreamWorks has so appealing? I, I think one of the things that uh, we find is, um, you know, there's a, oh, there's a lot of discussion around what's unique about China. I think one of the things that we believe is universal, regardless of what movie the writers Kung Fu Panda were not, is, is that everyone loves an amazing story. Right? Everyone loves a good story. It doesn't matter if you're a Chinese, you're American, you're Indian, you're Russian, you love a great story. And I think one of the things that made Kung Fu Panda as a franchise so exciting was, here's a story that was originally created by a studio in LA that had very little roots to China. They were able to take the national treasure of the panda, which is really cute, and then they're able to go and take this panda and make it do something extremely odd. <laughs> it make it do kung fu, right? It's like your, your typical image of a panda that sits there and gnaws on the bamboo 
And, and then now you're making this panda in a very active, very clumsy, very almost you know, whimsical way, and then you make it do kung fu, and you put this character through this amazing growth arc, the story arc, and then people are astounded that the, 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 the national image of China is now a Hollywood star, <laughs> right? I mean, think about it. And that, that makes a lot of people in China think, wow, we didn't realize the power of this particular symbol and how it resonates to the rest of the world. You know, by the way, the first team that did Kung Fu Panda, I, I think they may have only came to China once for about a week. I mean, it wasn't, a, it wasn't like they were here, right? And then, and then, and then uh, here, not in Singapore, but here in China. <laughs> uh, but, you know, and then, and then the second movie, you know, they were here more, and they were able to, you know, create an amazing extension of that. And then, you know, we're on our third movie now. And then the interesting thing about a third movie is this, this growth arc for us as a studio is the fact that we now have about 260 people in China, and a lot of them are working in tandem with the United States on our studio in Glendale to produce this wonderful movie. The huge difference that we're trying to make here, the differentiation, and this is one of the reasons why we're so excited about this, is our priv privilege for us to make Kung Fu Panda just for China. And, and I'll explain that in a second, because you know, all the animation movie script is in the US, they go through some kind of localization process, and then they now bring it to Chinese audience. What we're doing, in our studio is, is our artists is working collaboration to make two versions of the movie simultaneously. So the, the animation and the dialogue is tailored just for the Chinese audience, 1.3 billion people. And we like to show them and share that experience with them in, um, on, on January 29th of next year, right before Chinese New Year. For us, to, this is an amazing growth arc for us, starting from a Western animation, now to the fact that we're now creating an experience, and we really believe this is an amazing experience where the Chinese audience would not be able to tell that this is a Hollywood-made animation film. For them, it would be just like a Chinese animation film at the standard of Hollywood. I think that's something that's really exciting for us. And that's something we're gonna ask you a little bit more about, especially in relation to animation. But not everything is sunshine. Uh, it, <laughs> Rose can talk a little bit about how they're you know, there are two different kinds of films that get made, the art, the, the art, what we call the art house films and the commercial films. And clearly Hollywood has had an impact on that balance. What's going on with Chinese films and Chinese filmmakers? And I'm the doomsday person on the panel. No, no, no. <laughs> and the hope. We, 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 we don't want just, just not to well, rain on the parade. Well, well, there's something, you know, several people have brought up that's interesting, which is, um, uh, in, in the question of does Hollywood, uh, does China need Hollywood? I almost said does Hollywood need China because actually Hollywood needs China, I would argue, almost more than China needs Hollywood. Because uh, when we talk about why China needs Hollywood, it seems like we're really talking about global influence and exporting Chinese films out into the marketplace. But actually, um, the reason why Hollywood is so interested in China is because Ticket sales have, while box offices fluctuated up and down and pretty much gone up in the US, ticket sales, the number of people actually buying tickets have decreased in the US. So the US is forced to look elsewhere for additional audience, for growth in its market share. China, on the other hand, in the last five or six years, doubled the number of theaters um, here in China. I mean, I'm sorry, in China, we're in Singapore. Um, but in the U.S., it took 25 years to do the same thing, to double the number of screens. Uh, in, in China, the box office is growing at more than 30%, something like 36%. It's phenomenal, the speed at which the industry is growing there. Um, when you look at how many films are put out, uh, the U.S., I think, released about 700-plus uh, films last year, and China released almost 300. That's about half of the U.S. So the question is, there's so much upside potential in China, do they really need to look elsewhere until they get to that point? It, there are no theaters in third tier cities and fourth tier cities, or very little theaters in third tier and fourth tier cities. There used to be a very interesting film industry in China with the fifth generation, the sixth generation, you've heard them, the Zhang Mo's, the Raised Red Lanterns, To Live, um, uh, and so on, Chen Ge, uh, Farewell My Concubine, etc. And only recently have we noticed on the festival circuit that Chinese filmmakers self-identify between commercial filmmaking and art filmmaking. 
there was about 10 years when you came to China and asked filmmakers, or asked people if they were filmmakers, and they said yes, and they'd tell you what they do. But now, when you ask people what they do, they, they will first say, well, I'm a commercial filmmaker, or I I'm still an art filmmaker. And that's something Hollywood actually has brought into China, unfortunately, I would say. The distinction, because they're, they, they're not mutually exclusive. You know, films like Gravity, films like 12 Years a Slave are artistic and commercial, and somehow there's been this um, art versus commerce that's arrived in China. I don't think necessarily that's healthy for the industry. Well, is part of that just sort of an adaptation phase? Uh, even in Hollywood, look, and nobody can say that Hollywood produces a glut of amazingly artistically brilliant films. Uh, uh, there's certainly a lot of films <laughs> that everybody would be happy to uh, run screaming from, and that's not a new trend. Uh, you can go all the way back to the 1920s to see that. But for China, is that some of that now, is that, that a growing phase, or is that a, where people are adapting to this more broad commercial world, or do you think that that's something that uh, it's just here to stay, and there needs to be a way to address that issue and try and promote the artistic side. Well, I think this is a question. I would. Yeah. Some of you, yeah. Because no, no. this is exactly what I was talking about when the Chinese directors decided that they had to identify as commercial, you know, making movies for the audience directors in order that they could actually have a career in the film industry. Because right now, you know, uh, we, we're producers, but we're also investors. If somebody comes to me and says, well, I have this movie, Chinese director, I really just want to make it as an art film, and I don't care if the audience understands it or pays to see it, I'm going <laughs> to say sorry. But, but I, think that, I think that Kevin is right, that this is a transitional phase. Because if you see the incredible craftsmanship and artistry that a lot of the directors are bringing to these so-called commercial movies, ultimately they'll be doing, I think, what great movie makers do all over the world, which is going, OK, I'm going to make three movies for a big studio, and then I'm going to tell the head of the studio that I'm making my pet project. For example, Clint Eastwood does this all the time. Steven Spielberg does this all the time. Chinese directors will have the qualification and the bragging rights to do this with investors and studios. And I think it's not that far off. I think maybe five or 10 years from now. So I'm curious because they're out of, say, 300 <coughs> films, 34 of them are actually international because there's a quota system. So that means 270 films are actually Chinese made. Mm -hmm. Of which, well, of which by the way, 90% are losing money. Yes. Mm. And that's, that's correct. That's a, yeah. That's 90% of Chinese that's correct. films lose money. And only a very small strata of them are actually profitable. So mm. personally, I think the commercialization of Chinese films is actually a healthy, mm. it's a very healthy thing. And the same things happen in Hollywood. You, you, the, the smaller filmmakers are always eclipsed by the Avengers of the world. But then uh, that when you do have a healthy economic system that sustains all kinds of things like training, artist development, that brings people up, then they can, they can peel off and do very innovative things. That are, that are, that's really art. So I personally think it's a very healthy thing. And as, as, as we see more artists develop out of China, I think they're really comfortable straddling, straddling those both worlds. And that's a very good thing. I also, I also think that what, what we haven't discussed about all this, did the, you know, we're talking about the theaters and demographics. What's also radically changed, even in the last 18 months, is the demographic of moviegoers in China. So the, the 80s generation have largely begun to abandon cinema. Mm -hmm. And now it's the 90s generation that are buying tickets. So even a Monster Han movie we recently did, 66% female. So very different than what you would see in a US audience. And as a result, that, but that 90s audience, they grew up with BitTorrent. They grew up you know, getting anything they wanted pirated. They grew up with access to Western media. And Western media is what they thought was new and fresh. Now, I always like to remind um, people that Transformers is such a huge franchise in China because Transformers is an animation program. Mm. It was the first Western TV show that aired on Chinese television. So like, a, a, you know, having an affiliation with Transformers was a way for young people to say, I'm international. I think bigger than the, than the China um, experience. And so it's, as much as it's being driven by cinemas and cinema growth, it's being also driven by an infusion of Hollywood content over the last 15 years. 
that is making you know, that 90s generation, um, you know, that's what they hunger for, that's what they want. You know, we've worked with Zhang Yimo on a couple of pictures now, and we did Flowers of War with him. And on that picture, he talked a lot about, this is, I want to communicate to the rest of the world the Chinese experience in Nanjing and just how it affected us. And we're working with him now on a very different movie. It's a very commercial movie. It's about monsters. And he's like, I now want to reach an audience. I, I can't say anything <laughs> if no one shows up. So I have to get people to show up. And so it's a, there's a, a, a really interesting you know, adjustment there. And we've worked with the Chen Kai guys, and, and they come into office and say, how do I make it wow? <laughs> and and, you know, and we, we spend time, and uh, I'm a big uh, uh, Zhang Jiake fan. And you know, it's sitting with him and showing him how to do like a blood splatter on a on a window. <laughs> and he was like, "Oh, can I? I can can be anything. You can be artistic with the blood." And that was um, a lot of fun. And he began thinking about artistic ways to have people shot in the head, um, and that was <laughs> enjoyable. Uh, but I think that the, that as much as it's about growth in cinemas and it's about economic and middle class. It's also about a real change in the young culture of China. And, and I see, I mean, we, we look at our artists. The newer artists move faster. They, they accelerate. Sometimes it's a little tragic. We have guys who are 28 who are obsolete because the 24-year-olds can run circles around them because they had just that much more time with media. And so they, they get it faster. And so when a note comes from a director, if J.J. Abrams wants to, you know, if he references a movie, they're more likely to know the film. And so that's a big, it's the 90s generation as, as much as anything that are really changing. I think the average age of the Chinese person who actually would go to the movie theater today is 20.4. Yeah. And it's in, and Last year was 21, so it's actually becoming younger and younger. So. <laughs> yeah. And you think about that, it's an opposite trend to what's in the U.S. It is, and, 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 and what we see, like, so, you know, look, I'm, I'm obviously I'm, uh, really excited, and, and our company is, does great things. We have a great business. Um, you know, the, the other number that we haven't talked about is uh, market penetration. So in the U.S., which is a declining business, mm -hmm. market penetration is about 65%. About 65% of Americans go to see two movies a year. In China, which has all this construction of theaters, it has this young generation that is hungry for media, Market penetration is 14%. So in addition to growing all those screens, they are also going to they have they have so many more seats to fill in those theaters. And 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 the 20-year-old generation are going to be going to see movies for a long time. You know. And so it's a it's a really interesting demographic. Now, Peter, you you got something. If I may, uh, I just, before we we move on from the topic of whether Hollywood or China actually need each other. I have a view that they absolutely do. And I'm, I just want to drill in on these, these metrics, because it, it really bothers me when uh, this number of, ten, of Chinese box office is going to overtake North American box office as though that was the whole thing. It's really a misleading number. Obviously, I've drunk in my own Kool-Aid, so I'm fully, incredibly bullish on the Chinese marketplace. But let's, let's pick apart the numbers. So you have $10 billion. So first of all, the uh, online, the home video market, not included in, in uh, box office, including uh, digital online rights, home video rights in North America alone is about $17 billion a year. Yes. So, and then you take, to, you take into consideration that Hollywood movies actually receive about, uh, about 60, 70% of their revenues globally outside of North America, which is not open to China. When you put those things together, China is growing, but it's an infant. There, there, it's, when you compare the, the, the kind of growth tra trajectory that it has in front of it and the fundamentals of the business in terms of being able to exploit a motion picture through various windows, it's really just starting. So this is where China very much needs Hollywood. And then if you drill down further to the Chinese metrics, the box office, roughly 50% of it is actually imported movies from Hollywood. These are the blockbusters that's filling, that's putting butts in seats, that's creating the, the, this kind of economic miracle. So I think of the relationship between Hollywood and China as somewhat 
codependent. It's not very healthy. The Chinese officials need these large numbers to show off this kind of growth. At the same time, they need Hollywood movies to do very well, to supply the hardware, the things, the, the exhibitors, the need for growth, for innovation. So, and the Hollywood number of 50% roughly in, in terms of Chinese revenue is actually an artificial number. The, the regulators are actually keeping that number down with blackout dates and a number of other things. So if the real number today, without any kind of government intervention, I would, my sense is Hollywood would contribute to about 80, 90 percent of the box office. So those things are changing. For those things, for those reasons, I do see a great deal of collaboration and mutual need. It's true that Hollywood needs that growth in China, and China needs the innovation, needs not the innovation, maybe the creativity, the, the craftsmanship involved in putting these movies together. Also, the and contributing an understanding of how do you create profitable windows. So, right. Can I that, in my view, is a true approach. Moving on, but no, no. But it, this is good. One of the one of, what what Peter just said is so important because you know, ten billion dollars of box office in North America translates to something like fifty billion dollars when you have all the ancillary revenue streams. Whereas ten billion dollars of box office in China translates to maybe. $11 billion yes. because you don't have the ancillary revenue stream. So one of the interesting phenomena that's happening is a lot of Chinese companies are preferring to try to invest in Hollywood movies now rather than to invest in Chinese domestic movies because they can see, A, you know, their dollar of investment has a lot greater upside investing in a global release and B, they can learn these business models by participating in Hollywood movies. So it's a very interesting business exchange going on. And it's kind of funny because companies like ours want to invest in Chinese movies, but the Chinese investors want to invest in Hollywood movies. So it's just... Well, that, that's like a little... What you said, you know, in the, in the, in the little lead-up, you know, you talked about a, a siege, you know, yep. so everyone on the inside wants to get out, everyone outside wants to get yep. in. So what we find is all the, the big studios in China are all investing in Hollywood slates. But, yeah. but wouldn't that become an opportunity, though? For example, if you look at Monster Hunt, right? Like, Monster Hunt is an interesting <coughs> example where the director is Rama Hui. You know, he came out of DreamWorks, he did Shrek, and he also did uh, one of the uh, uh, Panda movies. He was able to marry um, Chinese mythology. Like, he, I mean, one of the things that's amazing about Monster Hunt, which I thought was very, for those of you who don't know, Monster Hunt is the number one Chinese box office right now, 2.4 billion MMB in box office. It's the first movie to, Chinese movie to, break the two billion threshold. Um, it, they did it in July, by the way, about three months after Furious 7, which broke the Chinese two billion record. So, so the, the, the interesting thing about Monster Hunt, I think, is the fact that Raman took what he learned, what he experienced in the US. He was able to work with base effects. But then he took something that's very core of China, the, 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 the myth that he developed, that he found. And then he was able to create, through his wonderful storytelling, an amazing new mythology. Instead of an old mythology, such as, I'm, I don't want to sound bad, but I'm picking on Journey to the West, another Journey to the West movie, <laughs> like the, the 14 of them that just came along. Um, another, you know, uh, uh, something about, uh, you know, other, other common, very popular mythology. He created something very fresh, very new. You know, I was having lunch with him the other day, and, you know, he, he asked him what he thought about the movie. I was like, I'm so impressed because for a long time, there has been no new myth in China. Mm -hmm. You created a brand new myth. Mm -hmm. and, and then you tell it in such a way that this myth mythology is now alive. How many Chinese movies in the past have been able to do that? And I think, I think it's not about needing one another. It's about this fusion. It's what I'm really excited about is what can this new creation, creative process be when you take the both the best of the East and the best of the West, and you kind of mush them together, and you shake it in the box and see what falls out. And I think, I think Monster Hunt is a great example of that, and I expect to see a heck of a lot more. And then the movie of that, the, 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 the fruition of that fusion will not just resonate in China, because that's, I think, the first experiment. I think it has tremendous potential to maybe go to regional next, and then maybe even faster, maybe you know, next is, to, is, is worldwide. I think that's something that would be, you know, I think Zhang Yimou might be thinking something along those lines. And I think this is something that I'm really excited to see. Yeah. And that worldwide uh, element is something I want to bring up, because in this idea of, the, of, the China, of Chinese productions, you know, right now they're still mostly focused on China. But 
with, you mentioned Journey to the West, and Journey to the West is very successful in China, but you know what version of Journey to the West most Americans are familiar with? It's not even Chinese. It's the Japanese anime Japanese Dragon Ball. One. Right, 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 uh, yeah. yeah. And so you think about it, they took the characters of Journey to the West, made them aliens, and marketed it to kids. So uh, the, the hope is that when you know, these great stories are being taken from China, that this, this will change. So what's going on in China in terms of the Chinese artistic ability that can take these stories and make them appeal to a broader worldwide audience? Well, one of the, like, so, so when we, we sit with clients and, and talk with them, one thing is that the producers have largely been um, distrustful of the market in China. So there's been a lot of downside risk avoidance in terms of budgeting. And the one thing that Monster Hunt did and uh, Monkey King, uh, The Hero is Back, which is an animated film that broke all the animation records this summer, those two films showed producers that quality finds an audience that the audience is actually there. If you put a quality product in front of them, they will come out and spend money. And so what we're seeing now is a lot, you know, in our business, um, uh, the budgets have gone, and a lot, our, our typical contracts have gone from around $200,000 for a movie to close to $14 million over three years. That's impressive. And that's, that's how big the, the producers, they're like, they gotta go big now, because they recognize that the market is big enough to support it. And we sat with the producer of The Monkey King Here Was Back, and we had, we had a long talk with him about that film. They uh, did about $200 million in China. Uh, for the US rights, they got three. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we, we explained to them that had they spent a little bit more money um, and done a little bit more on the quality, they could have probably left about $100 million on the table mm -hmm. as a product. You know, and so, so, so now they're going to rethink how they do the sequel. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, and Ellen's fought those battles on Journey to the West, right? You know, how do you make a movie that's big enough to go international, but small enough to hedge your risk in China? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, it's always, I think the one thing that Monster Hunt did is it broke down some of those barriers. By the way, does anybody on this panel know what's happening internationally with Monster Hunter? Because I think that's I the other part of the shoe that would be really interesting to understand. Sold to Film Rise in the U.S. for I think 2.5 million dollars. So it's just a minimum guarantee. And it's a year. American. It's a million minimum what guarantee. What about it? Come out what about year. in terms of pre-sales or or international sales distribution rights? Not much. Yeah. But that was done before though. That was before they made a big hit though, right? Yeah. No, even even after. I mean, it's just look. So I just uh, I just came back from while well, I was in L.A. Um, I screened Monster on L.A. for you know a bunch of filmmakers and executives. Um, got the DCP from DreamWorks, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and it was interesting because they all walked away saying that was a really well-made movie. They were surprised at how good it was and they didn't think it felt that Chinese. Mm -hmm. And conversely, when I speak to Chinese producers, they say Monster Hunter's a very Hollywood movie. They don't think of it as a Chinese film because they think of Raman's influence yeah, yeah. as a director. You know, it was pretty interesting because uh, so so the other day, don't don't tell my boss or anybody this. You know, I, I once in a while I do. This is this is being filmed. It's a secret yes. in this. <laughs> I do, I, so, so one of the thing one of the thing I do is when I check the popularity of a movie is is I actually go to these not so legit torrent sites to see what are the top downloads. Yeah. If you ever want to check to see what the popularity is and how mm -hmm. you know see how it goes, how many how many leeches, how many sees, you go see that. You use piracy as a gauge for popularity. What was surprising was I pop it up, and two days in a row, number one download was Monster Hunt. Yeah. So, so don't know what, this is not just downloading in China. This is globally. So, so be interesting to see what happened. This is like, uh, when I had lunch, I had lunch with uh, Raman on Tuesday. So it was like Monday, Mon Sunday or Monday. I, 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 I just checked it out. And, and it'd be interesting to see how this affects, once you have this proliferation, how this affects his brand how his CP business, how his other ancillaries in terms of, you know, maybe Netflix would now be interested and they weren't before, I don't know. Uh, they weren't, and, and this, is, this is the thing, there was not a lot of trust yep. in the mar for the market, yep. so they weren't prepared. Now, I, I assure you, Bill Kong will be prepared for the sequel. But, <laughs> so when, you throw in the, when you throw in the other dynamic, which is Wanda controlling a very substantial piece of the global theatrical mm -hmm. footprint, and that they're now the biggest distributor producer in China in terms of box office, so the perfect storm is being brewed. I think the, the mainstream point of view with Chinese executives and investors is that they want a Hollywood piece in everything that they do. These are the pieces they're looking for. 
Um, they're looking for production expertise. They're looking for storytelling expertise. There's an understanding that there's a way to structure your script in such a way that would be very accessible to the average person. Because the Hollywood movie has worked, has worked around the world, including China. There's a recognition there. Um, I've, sadly, there's also a recognition that the new breed of Chinese filmmakers haven't yet stepped, they're not able to step forward and helm these very, very large visual effects driven types of movies. Um, they would like to, they're not ready to step up and I think the investment community is also fairly um, reticent to back it. Subsequently, uh, to your point James, about this kind of coming together synergy. Uh, so Monster Hunter is an example, here's a Hollywood trained a uh, filmmaker who went to China and made this film. You look at the other films that have worked this year, The Return of the Hero, which is an animated film about uh, the Monkey King. Uh, you see shots completely lifted from Hollywood movies and it's, it's a very Hollywood style film. And then you look at the other film that everybody talks about, which is Pancake Man, which is a riff, <laughs> off, of, riff off of the superhero genre movie. Uh, so then again, this kind of fusion is taking place and I, I don't think it's, the, the mainstream understanding in China is that we need Hollywood, uh, we want the expertise, we don't necessarily need ho the Hollywood studios, which are, uh, it's interesting to note that some of the biggest deals that have been pulled off in the past five years, whether it's acquisitions, co-production financing, have been with major ind independents, the Lionsgates of the world, the STXs, guys who are being able to deliver Hollywood product minus the Hollywood uh, deal making that's known and associated with the major studios. You know, um, so there's three ways that China takes a bite into Hollywood, right? So one is they do it with money. Mm -hmm. I want to invest in your movie. Second one is market access. You know, right. um, you know I, I'll invest in your movie, but you help me promote into China. I want a big share of that. Second one, the third one is very simple, a story, right? Mm -hmm. And it, that's the hardest one. And that's the yeah. one that actually lasts and has durability. I think the other two are very superficial. I think the part about script is so hard is that there's a formula, like just like, you know, uh, you, you said there's an absolute formula. But the challenge is, is that the Chinese education system, a lot of the teachers that are teaching the, in the Chinese schools aren't trained in that. They're trained actually, when I talk to them, many of them are actually from the Soviet. They're trained Soviet training. Ooh. You know, you may ask them, it's like, like, but you know, Soviet at a certain time has some Russians have amazing Great. movies. Yeah. I mean, Sergei Einstein, if you've ever seen in Battleship and Temkin, is a mm -hmm. classic. You know, some, you know, I walk into one, he had his thing on his wall, you know, I mean, for them, this is still an art. So they're teaching them how to do it in that way, but they're not teaching the three act, for example, that we talked about. They're not teaching the specific details that we will drill into to explore the story, to build out the character, to really think about the arc of each, not just the protagonist, but each of the sub-characters in the, in, the, in the story that goes with it. And I think that's the part I think that's, uh, that's be interesting to see how collaboratively we can help teach this new generation because there's no generate, if this generation doesn't come across, I can't scale my business. I cannot scale in China. I have to import everything from the US and that's really expensive. In fact, there are like 10,000 film schools in Europe, 10,000 film graduates in Europe and about um, like over 8,000 graduate from US every year and China graduates 3,000. Mm. You can see the scale. And then um, there's like 3,000 film festivals in the world. Well, part of, I think, the, the, the maturation of the Chinese film industry is actually education in terms of the sophistication of seeing a lot of films, reading a lot of literature, seeing a lot of art. And uh, when you look at film festivals, there are about over 3,000 or about 3,000 in the world. 70% of them are in North America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, China has six. So there isn't, uh, the, the, the habit of going to see movies is very, very, um, new and there needs to be an entire generation. What we say in North America is that you have to get them before about 12 or 13 because at that age they start deciding what movies they want to go see. So they have to see films between 4 and about 10. It's when parents go take their kids to see the movies and actually that determines, you know, um, uh, it's not scientific, but in the film festival world, we understand that if a child sees, for example, subtitled films before the age of nine, if they're fluent in subtitled films, they have no problem with subtitled films later on. If you don't show them a subtitled film until they're a teenager, they'll barely go see them, and then you lose them from 15 mm. to 20, they're gone. Which is what's happened in America. Yes. One of yeah. the biggest reasons. You know, it, it, and not just with yeah. subtitles, with black and white for that matter. So That's it right. really is. Yeah. 
But in China, it's really interesting because the population is going backwards. It's going from small screen to big screen. And in, in the US and the rest of the parts of the world, we're very worried about losing the theatrical experience to the small screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, already happening. Sorry? It's all, it's all in television now. Well, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, most repeat film goers are actually own like four key pieces of technology. So actually, technology drives a lot of the film going audience. But I'm curious on the panel for those who are making the films, like, you know, we saw this in the fashion industry. There was a long time in which the Chinese industry was just simply copying everything. And they were copying over and over again. And at a certain point, there's a, there's a paradigm shift and an innovation begins. Right. And I'm, I'm curious as to where you think we're well, that, at that's that point. actually a really good segue because one of the things we're all talking about how can, how, essentially, how can China merge into the global film industry, but that's not really the holy grail. I mean, look at the great film industries of the world. Putting America aside, but even America really has two industries. It has its global films that play everywhere. It has its local films that rarely play outside of the United States. Mm -hmm. And India, for mm -hmm. as long as India's had a film industry, the maximum that Hollywood movies ever have taken of the Bollywood box office has been 20%. Mm -hmm. Japan, which now is the Brilliant. third biggest film industry in the world because China surpassed it a couple of years ago, is overwhelmingly these days watching Japanese movies. Chinese movies are going to be developing new ways of telling mm -hmm. stories and new ways of connecting with the audience on their relatable day-to-day -day level. And I really believe that there's always going to be Chinese movies that don't travel, but that's OK. And there may be some that have universal, you know, certain genres can travel better because animation travels, science fiction travels, you know, suspense thrillers travel. But when you get these things that are really in the DNA of everyday life, A, they don't need to travel, and B, um, why should they? Because you know the Chinese industry can be self-sufficient and support these local movies. So that's, I mean, you enjoy, I don't know, I enjoy these Pancake Man movies and even <laughs> Tiny Times franchise. They're not even actually movies based on what the standard definition is of a movie. But that doesn't mean that they're not really fun to watch and that they're not making a lot of money. So, But didn't you just make an argument that, isn't your argument that China doesn't really need Hollywood then? Not at all, because A, the well, audience needs Hollywood You have to define Hollywood, Hollywood first. What is Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, no, we'll get I mean, to that yes, in a moment. That's right. yeah. First of all, the Chinese film industry is run by the audience. Mm -hmm. It's not run by anyone else. The audience wants to see Hollywood movies. End of story, right? Everything that you've talked about, the cinema chains, the distributors, everything would just collapse without Hollywood movies, because they take up about 50% or more of the box office. More. It could but, be. But well, you know, that's even yeah. that's a little misleading because uh, right now most of the ticket sales, just because we have um, a huge piece of the cinemas, are actually bought by online ticketing, online like that's ten right. cent the Baidu. They pre-buy yep. all the tickets, so it's distorted the the analysis on the audiences. They're they're buying all these shows, so these shows register as sold out when in fact the theaters are sometimes empty because yeah. the tickets don't necessarily get resold. So the box office is a little skewed in China. It's very hard to know what's really popular. Well, that's the China, that's the China element to this. There was, there was a scandal last week about Monster Hunt because it crossed the, 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 it became, it's the first time in 20 years a Chinese movie's been the most successful movie of the year in China. And so it's a big deal, but someone looked into the data and saw that the, the screenings at a particular theater started every 15 minutes. <laughs> and it's a two hour movie. And so uh, that's, and so that's it was sold work. out every show with 15 minute starts. And, um, and that was a little bit of a controversy. Well, mm -hmm. what's driving that? Because if a company's gonna spend the money on that, what, what's their upside? It's well, the upside is that success become, you know, generates more success and we're seeing that the, the Chinese audience is not too dissimilar from folks in North America. You hear about this huge success and you're utterly left out if you're not part of it. 
So, and, and the tale of it is, it was a, it was also, an, a clear state interest that that movie be a number one movie. It was decided. I mean, it, a, a decree was made that Monster Hunt would stay in theaters until September 16th. It was decided. So again, the design. You have to, Chinese films have to be above the 50% mark every year. So yeah. if it falls below the 50% mark, then somebody's going to lose their job. Yeah. Mm. And, and, so and you, you, like, you may have all, the other, the other, this is, these are the things you have to deal with you know, if you're in the market is there are also there are a lot of market distortions. And so this last two weeks ago, there was another um, situation where uh, a government film uh, promised theater owners they could keep 100% of the box office for the first week if it did well. And lo and behold, the film <laughs> did incredibly well. <laughs> yeah, you can't imagine them ever doing that in the US. And a Tom Cruise movie didn't do so well those days, but a lot of people saw the Tom Cruise movie with a so ticket. What are you, what are you saying, had, Chris? With a ticket that had another movie's name on it. Um, <laughs> And so that's, that's just part of, that's part of you're still in a, in a planned economy, you're still in a state-run economy. Those kinds of things still happen, um, and you have to be aware of it. One thing I want to go back to, because you're talking about Pancake Man, is that there's a bit of an inversion that's going on in some ways in terms of where the content's coming from. And uh, that traditionally, we tend to view a top-down model, uh, uh, in particularly in the U.S., but here you've got some, Pancake Man has a slightly different origin. So what's going on there and what does that mean for the future? Well, the, the average age of the Chinese audience being 20, 21, they grew up in a, a completely digital, online, wireless, social media environment. And what they read, for the most part, when they read is online novels or blogs. So a number of the most profitable, successful, you know, epic new franchises, Tiny Times, um, you know, Pancake Man, um, this other movie that came out based, it called Go Away, Goodbye Mr. Goodbye, Tumor, Mr. which was actually a Wanda movie, came from a blog of a young woman uh, illustrator who uh, was very fanciful, had a great following in China, and then she was diagnosed with Hodgkin's and she died at the age of 29. But she kept writing about her experience on her blog, publishing you know, fanciful pictures of the bad demons who were coming to take her away and all this stuff. That was made into a movie. That is a completely online to offline experience. And that's pretty much the road to success for China. Even with Hollywood movies, Chinese audiences know about Hollywood movies because they're online all the time. They know six months in advance that they want to see the next Mission Impossible franchise. They know when it's coming out. All they need to know is when it's getting released in China. It is a completely, a complete inversion, as you said, of what we used to call sequential distribution, which went from cinema to home video to pay TV to free TV, finally to online, completely opposite in China. And it's changing the way the world does business in the film industry. Now, given that, what do you do then to capture this young audience? And James, you, you, you've got a, a product in animation that is some often viewed as, as uh, immersive for a younger population, but isn't truly successful unless it gets a broader group. What do you do to try and bring people so in? It's interesting that? that you get brought up Pancake Man, because if you listen to the dialogue, I couldn't understand half of it because I'm yeah. old. Right. It's, well, it's so like, you don't live in Beijing. Well, I live in Beijing, and, and, and unfortunately, when I read this stuff, I, I mean, I, w I watch it with my team, and the young people all laugh, and I had to constantly interrupt them, her and say, hey, what, what did this mean? What did this mean? Because, because there is a new lingo that comes around. There's slang that comes around. I'm, I'm just not keeping up with it as much as I should. But, but the fact is that as part of it, the Kung Fu Panda franchise, we're going to be successful in three. We need to be in touch with the, with the, the, the lingos, with, with the, the expressions and the nuances. So, so what we do is, is, unlike other movies that may have been imported in, which they go through a very global localization process. There's a machine that every studio uses to crank out these, these uh, 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 translations to Chinese. Many of them are actually done in Hong Kong or Taiwan, which, by the way, speaks and express themselves somewhat differently. So, so that when they come to China, and then when the people read their subtitle, when they hear it dubbed, it's not natural. So one of the things we actually had to do is we, you know, we had to take a different filter 
not only do we need to filter it from a translation, making sure the spirit or the context of the dialogue, and this is specifically with dialogue, is correct, but also the way that we express the expression. So we actually have a very rigorous process where we have screenwriters, we have directors that go through every single dialogue and says, okay, this doesn't really work in China. That's, how do you, what would, what it would work to make it funny? You know, like, uh, you know, if, uh, there, there's a classic example, we were in the studio, Tuesday night with Jay Chow, and we're doing the, 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 the voice casting. And, you know, and, uh, I clearly remember the, the, the U.S. line, because I just saw it this morning, it was, you know, it was a line that says something like, you know, oh, she wants a salad on the side, or she wants something on the side, you know, like a, you know, like a, uh, like a, uh, sorry, like a uh, uh, salad dressing or something on the side. Well, clearly, that doesn't, there's nothing like that that's funny or expressible in China. So they actually change it and say, hey, you know, let's use this ex pretty interesting Chinese phrase. It's called, uh, uh, I don't know how to, there's no Chinese English equivalent. <laughs> but, 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 but for the people who understand in China, Chinese is like, it's a very hot expression. But they're able to in integrate that into the conversation. So instead of having the character saying, I want something on the side, she says, I want something really spicy in my soup. Mm -hmm. So you, this, this then you crazy take it something, spicy. right, exactly, it's a creative spicy, I don't yeah, know how to, crazy spicy, crazy spicy, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and a very interesting slang, and then halfway through the recording of this particular line, Jay Chow stopped and said, well, what the heck does this mean? <laughs> and then we actually had to explain it, because I didn't know what it, he looked over, I, I didn't know what it means, but, but the thing is, is that these are the things that we need to do to hit the, the 90s, the, 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 the 90s generation, the people who are in the 2021, the 60% the, the, the who are female demographics, that we can gravitate to, because if you're absolutely right, we are a family movie, and, and the audiences right now that's in the market are the 90s generation and, and are mostly female heavy. I'm curious how the um, first Kung Fu Panda, which was basically made by an expat team, how they localized the movie for China. Well, well I, I, think, I think part of it was um, they gone through, China was also in a very different place back then. So this is like eight years ago in terms of the film industry. So the broad appeal is very much the people who like Western animation or, or Western movies. If you, if you go to movie in China, so, so you go to movie theaters in probably within the fourth ring row of Beijing, you go to a Chinese movie theater, when they do a imported film release, they will have two versions, English and a dubbed Chinese version. And in many cases, the number of screens that show the English will actually be more than Chinese. Mm -hmm. So inside, inside the fourth ring road, there's a huge Western population, uh, well, English-speaking population. But I live by the airport, I'm outside of the fifth ring road. I go to the theater that's down the street from my house, they're 100% Chinese. Mm. So, so, so the, the fact is, is that eight years ago, the people that are able to see the Kung Fu Panda are probably looking at it from a very different set of lens than mm -hmm. they are today. Mm -hmm. Like people expect that quality of translation to be that, high, that good, whereas back then, the, the the story was amazing enough to take them away, mm -hmm. and then they, can, they understand the English dialogue in most cases, so they get through that. But I think that that standard is no longer, if, you, if I do that with Kung Fu Panda, I'm not sure I'd be successful. Mm. So localization is all. Right, that specific. is very, very key. And I think this, if, if, if Hollywood movie wants to really do well consistently, not just a one, I think this type of effort or this type of uh, detail uh, investment is required. Yeah. It's absolutely required. You're you almost know. like retelling the movie all over again in post. I've, I've been part of this experience where they're literally trying to cre recreate the, the log lines that are, that are locally relevant and interesting. So it was something interesting to witness. Now, the, I, for animation, that makes a lot of sense. When you're, in, when you're dubbing, that makes sense. But what about that trend that we saw, that little clip of Iron Man 3 with that inserted scene? Uh, for the Chinese audiences. How is that actually? I think it actually backfired. It backfired in a really, really big way because when, I don't know if you guys recall, Iron Man was allegedly to have been co-produced with China. So there was a great deal of anticipation and, and, and pride on, on, on the part of the Chinese people that we've actually, we've actually arrived. We've arrived, our stars have made it into this major Hollywood vehicle and you go to the movie theater and um, they spent about two, three seconds on, on screen, the biggest, the biggest actors from China uh, receiving very, very little tepid uh, reception from Hollywood. So that turned into a major embarrassment. In fact, they actually created a term to describe this kind of scenario, yeah, which is sauce. kind of putting something in soy sauce. Yeah, exactly. So, so, they, they, so now when they're in business with a Hollywood producer, they want to know that, is this going to be one of those soy sauce deals where you're, it's like a, <laughs> it's like a dumpling and you just put a little bit of soy sauce on top, but it's not really the whole meal. I so, think 
main, I think problem, <clears throat> main problem with that is, is that, sorry, I didn't mean to yeah, cut you off. No, I'm, I'm, I'm done. That, that Ben Kingsley's character was called the Mandarin and he was the villain. Yes. And I think that didn't go over very well. I, I think that was also, that, that reflected a different issue. I don't issue. know how that got past the story editors. Well, I think that came down to the fact that they were actually afraid of having a genuine Chinese villain. Uh, because Mandarin in the original stories was a mainland Chinese warlord who had managed to stay immortal by getting rings. Yes, it's my, my childhood geek side coming out, sorry. But, it, uh, but the fact was that it was supposed to be a Chinese villain, and the U.S. filmmakers ran away from that. And is that so Gandhi and, wasn't able to neutralize it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. So <laughs> it, it, what you talk about sort of a, a comic situation, and behind Gandhi, the real villain was in fact an American. So is it, that something that's coming in where the Chinese market is actually diminishing what might have been more appealing, being able to cast a genuine Chinese star because of fear? Mm -hmm. And part of it comes down to, and this is one other thing just to ask, is that you, you have that limit of the 34 films. What exactly is uh, triggering what films get in? You know, is there, is it, what's the kind of determinant and are, is Hollywood making mistakes because they're so desperate to get in where they're submarining themselves either for Chinese audiences, what Chinese audiences really want, or uh, otherwise just impinging things because they're so desirous to be there? Well, having worked at a major studio for a long time importing movies to China, I can say Hollywood is not ever um, putting aside the possibility of having any of their movies released in China. So every major studio will submit their, almost their entire slate to China Film Group for review in the hopes that two or three of them will get in. I think the Chinese, the, the people who select the films for the Chinese audience have an amazing track record. They basically, for the most part, select really good Hollywood movies. Now, yes, they're not going to select a small art film which deals with some obscure aspect of American history that China doesn't care about, but they are going to pick the global franchises that have the best production values, that have the biggest stars that they know the Chinese audience wants to see. And those Chinese audience members who want to see these Hollywood movies do not want them with soy sauce. They really <laughs> don't, because if you sit in the theater, with somebody, you know, with a big Chinese audience grouping who's watching one of these movies. As soon as some stupid thing comes on, whether it's an out of place product placement or it's a Chinese actor who they get a fleeting glimpse of and then disappears into the background, they're on their cell phones. They're just, they're zoning out of the movie. They're out of it. They're not enjoying it. Or worse, they're, they're texting to all their friends to say that how stupid, something yeah. has gone wrong. But there's and, now movie theaters that cater to that, right? Where yeah. you, it's like, it's like a Twitter feed on, on the side so walls where you can be constantly commenting. You know, we, I mean, the, it, it, to sound a little bit philosophical, it's really true that when you watch a movie in a cinema, you give yourself to that movie. You willingly suspend your cynicism, your, you get into the movie, you enter the world of the movie. But as soon as they see something like that, that where it's just pandering, they're out of the movie. And that's just not, it's just a waste. All right. Actually. Well, we're down to about four minutes left. So at this point, I just want to go through each of you and say, what do you expect to see in the trend in terms of the Chinese film industry and movies being released in China in the next few years? What's the big thing that you, uh, the thing that you positive thing you see going forward? Peter? Well, I think when we're talking, I think we spend a lot of time talking about the mechanics of the process, and it's easy to lose sight of the whole picture. And let me try to pull back a little bit. My personal view is that uh, the I word innovation is very much alive and well in China, and that when you strip it all away, mo movies are just basically up to two, three hours of video. So when, once you ha have that understanding, that it becomes the tip of a spear. A movie generates so much discussion and so much influence that they're in, in the part of China knowing how to leverage that kind of attention span into other really meaningful verticals. I'm betting we're investing that the connection between online games and movies will be incredible and then it has bleeds into consumer, consumer products and that innovation in terms of digital media, social media, audience engagement, crowdfunding, crowdsourcing in China that is now mainstream is going to, it's going to reshape the whole global industry and global practices that can now be implemented in Hollywood for a variety of uh, historic legacy reasons. 
So Great. for that reason, I think we're going to see a new global giant with a new brand new business model emerging out of China that will have significant global ramifications. And that's what we, are, we at Orb are betting on. Thank you. Now, Chris? Um, bigger movies and movies of travel. Um, you're going to see, you know, what we're seeing from our clients and the projects that come to us is that the scope and scale of movies in China are growing rapidly. The, um, the capacity and the desire for investment is growing. Um, and so there is sort of a race on to make movies that, that compete globally. I think it's going to take about three years. Mm -hmm. Rose? I think WeChat is symbolic because it's the most sophisticated social media tool beyond Facebook, beyond Twitter, beyond WhatsApp. It's kind of the um, convergence of all three. And while the US is very busy trying to figure out how to create convergence between new media platforms and traditional media platforms, China's already there because it went the other direction from new media and the small screen to the big screen. And you're going to see a, you know, not a collision, but a merging of the two sides very quickly. And I think China will do it. Great. Ellen? Um, I think there's a, going to be a very big extension of uh, content creation into location-based entertainment. And I know that that's what you guys are betting on. There are uh, a number of major theme park projects being developed in China. There's a Universal one. There's Disney. Um, you guys are doing a city walk kind of a yep. development. Um, I know there's one going in Chengdu. There's one going in Guangdong. These are multi-billion dollar projects. And all of those projects are going to need some valuable Chinese franchises that have longevity and that people will be able to go and say, wow, well, I can see you know, this Fast and Furious exhibit, this show, but I can also go into the world of Monster Hunt or go into the world of the Monkey King and experience this. That is going to be a great thing for the Chinese audience and the Chinese consumer base. Great. James? I think talent. Um, in the short term, there'll be a shortage of really, really great talent. But I think really quickly, you know, in the short horizon, we will see a huge explosion of Chinese talent across all disciplines of filmmaking. Everything from development to production, cinematography, post-production, editing, music. I think that part is definitely uh, the, the growth. Without that talent, we can't sustain any of the, the, the thing we talked about, because it's all about the story and all about the content. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks to the audience for not tuning out and keeping your eyes on the screen. And thanks to our wonderful panelists.